Our scripture lesson today comes from Acts, the second chapter, beginning at verse 41. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we are so thankful for your love and grace that surrounds us this day. And as we've read from your holy word, we pray once more you might challenge our faith and speak to our souls. Help us, dear God, once more to understand what it means to be one of your disciples, to be someone who follows you, not only with our consent, but with our actions, with the way in which we live. We're so thankful for your love and your presence, and we pray, dear God, for your strength. Amen. Well, the party's over. Easter was last week. Everyone's left town. It's just us. What are we going to do now? There's something about life that's hard to adjust to and difficult to accept because we like to have those high moment experiences. We like the mountaintop. We like the vacations and the experiences that are exhilarating and that challenge us and call for the best of us. But in reality, most of our life is spent not on the mountaintop and hopefully not way down deep in the valley, but on the hillside somewhere, simply trying to make do and survive. And so we are here today, the day after the week after Easter, and the crowds have gone, and our attendance is down. Hopefully our offering will be up, and we're here. And what are we going to do? Well, one of the things that I'm going to be doing in the next three weeks is doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be talking about how we as a church and how we as a nation are changing, and what we need to be doing as a congregation in order to adjust to those changes that are coming. Now, there is no doubt that change is in the air. We see it everywhere we turn. We've gone from a very provincial type of marketing now to where everything is global. And we buy products from everywhere around the world and we ship products to everywhere around the world. We live in a global economy. We live in a world where an action that takes place far on the other side of the world in a country that we may have never visited may have direct financial impact on our pensions and on our lives because we're all so interconnected. It's a change that's hard for us to accept. It's difficult for us to realize that these changes are coming and there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. It is there and we have to learn to deal with it. Well, the church is also facing some tremendous changes. United Methodist Church continues to lose members in the United States. Our membership has decreased since 1968 every single year. Because of that, we're now closing churches, trying to find enough ministers to fill positions, trying to bring people together in a way that will make the church still the church, but deal with the realities that we face. When I was the district superintendent in Paducah, I had the duty of closing a number of churches. And I remember one church in particular that the church was kept alive as long as the matriarch was alive. One person. There were only five people in attendance. But they kept that church open and they kept that building taken care of. Well, when that lady died, that church closed in two weeks. There was no reason to go on. The support was no longer there. We're living in that kind of world. 
We're facing some crises in the United Methodist Church where we're going to have to learn to make changes or we too are going to die. You see, the problem is we as United Methodists are older than the general population. And we ministers are older. And so that means that we've got an old preacher for an old church. And there's nothing wrong with that other than eventually the demographics catch up with you. And so studies have been done and in 2018 it is predicted that what is called a death tsunami will hit the United States and in particular hit the United Methodist Church where we will see an increase in the doubling of the death rate from 2018 to 2050. That's where all we baby boomers come in. Well, can you imagine what's going to happen to a church when you have 12 to 15 deaths a year and suddenly you have 30 or 40? It's going to decimate churches. And many of our country churches today are on the verge of, of dying and closing simply because the numbers cannot support what it takes to be in ministry. Because just as our membership has declined, actually our giving has increased, but it's reached the top level now. And if we're not careful, it's going to start coming down. So what are we to do? Well, the United Methodist Church looked at all 32,228 congregations and it picked out what it considered to be vital signs of a church, things that would help a church understand its vitality. Of those 32,228 churches, 5,000 were deemed as being vital, about one in seven. Murray First is in the vital congregation category. We are a vital church. We have so much going on, and I am so appreciative of every single thing that has already taken place in this church. And even the worship service this morning, you would have thought that we got together and planned it out, but we didn't because it all seems to be fitting together about what God is leading us to do. There are five signs of a vital congregation. First is pastoral leadership that has a sense of longevity. When I was on, a, on the cabinet, we moved some preachers every other year and really needed to move them every year. Well, the longer a pastor stays, the longer and better a church will be as far as its depth and its ability to be in ministry. And I want to make that pledge to you that I want to be here to help you in that effort. And when it comes to preaching, I want you to know that we're a Bible church and I'm preaching the Bible. Now, it may not be anything you've ever heard before, but it's the Bible, because I'm sharing with you what God has laid on my heart. But a second characteristic of a vital congregation is that it is a church that has num numerous small groups and includes activities for children and youth. In other words, it is open. It allows everyone to participate. And that's a wonderful characteristic that we have already in our congregation. A third characteristic is that the church has both contemporary and traditional worship services. In fact, we don't need to fight that battle about which one's best. They're both necessary. In fact, we probably need to add another one or two that would meet even other needs in our, in our community. The more worship opportunities we have, the better we're going to be. The fourth characteristic are laity that are actively involved in the leadership and the life of the church. In other words, people who realize that it's more than just the staff's responsibility to do things. The staff is here to guide and to lead. It's not to live out your spiritual commitment. You have to live that out in your life. You have to find what God wants you to be. And you have to be willing to put that to work. The fifth characteristic is a church that increases its giving, especially in the area of missions. 
because we can be tempted to spend all of our funding on ourselves to build a wall around the block and say, we're not letting anybody else in and we're going to take care of us. And that's a sure recipe for death. And eventually, inevitably, it will occur. So those five things are signs of vital churches. And we, I think and pray, have those in our church right now. But we've got to be diligent. And we have to keep working at it. Now there are some things that we can't change. We can't change our location. We can't move out to the bypass. We don't have a bypass, do we? We can't move anywhere. We're here. This is, this is where we're at. This is our mission. This is our ministry. This is our spot. We cannot change the age of this building. It's old in spots, and it needs repair. We're looking at over $100,000 of roof repair this year. And I'm thinking, Lord, is that going to be my legacy? The preacher that put a new roof on the church? Give me something a little more than that. We can't change that. We're going to have to deal with it. And that means we're going to have to support the efforts to keep our facilities in the best possible condition because there are facilities that are used every day of the week, it seems like something is going on. We're not like the church that just opens up on Sunday morning and closes at noon and no one's ever around for the rest of the week. There's always something going on here. We can't change our location, we can't change our building, we can't change our age. I mean, I wish I could get, some, get younger, and I wish every time we took communion we'd take a couple of years off our age, but it just doesn't happen. We're, we're getting older, every single one of us, and that's just going to happen. There are a few things that we have a little bit of control over. We can be more inviting to people outside the community that are different. We can be more open ethnically to people that are of different races and creeds. We can invite them in. We can be open to different genders in the sense that churches with more men at work that are active are churches that are growing. Men's ministries can be significant in the life of a church. And then we can be open to letting all of the different ages participate in the life of our congregation. In other words, we give them a place and a space to share their faith. I think back in my own ministry as I started preaching at the age of 16, I mean, I bet I had some humdingers of sermons back then. <laughs> Whew! But you know, the congregation loved me in spite of all of my imperfections and all of my immaturity and it has helped, hopefully made a difference in my life. So we can change how we approach different people by opening ourselves up. There are some things that we can absolutely have control over. Number one, we can avoid conflict. Scripture says, learn to live peaceably with all people. The church isn't a battleground for your little battle that you want to fight about whatever it is. The church is a place where we come to worship God. And so we avoid conflict by realizing that even though we're different and even though we have differences of opinion, we come together to worship God and all that we do brings glory and honor to His name. And so we make an effort to avoid that conflict. We realize that our own personal dedication is what God is calling us to be and to do. It's not going to be the right preacher or the right church officials that change this church or keep this church from suffering through all of these changes. It's going to be all of us together. And if you look at that passage of scripture that I read, it's talking about the aftermath 
of Easter and what occurred in the early church. They were all together and they shared everything and they had a common purpose and God was adding to their numbers because of what? A joy and a happiness that was a part of their lives. And to me, that's what the gospel message is all about. It's about good news that changes our hearts and gives us a fresh understanding of God's love and God's grace. We can look at our lives and we can change. And in the next few years, those churches that are willing to make the necessary changes will grow. But that means we have to be willing to turn loose of some of our territory. We have to be open to those who are different. We have to realize that it's not about us. It's about the kingdom of God. When John Wesley started his ministry, he started it to reform the Anglican church because the Anglican church had turned its back on the poor and the oppressed. It had become an upper class church for the wealthy and gentry, those that had means. John Wesley saw a multitude of people out in the world that hadn't heard the gospel and weren't being included because there was nothing there to welcome them in. And so he started preaching about the assurance of faith and that God loves everyone, not just a few. Needless to say, he started getting thrown out of pulpits all across England. And when I say thrown out, I mean that almost literally in times. He was literally thrown out of the church and refused access to the pulpit. In his home church of Epworth, where he was raised, and his father was a minister in that local church, they refused him the ability to speak from the pulpit. And so he went outside, and Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, he stood on his father's tomb, and he preached to the multitudes. Needless to say, Wesley was in trouble with the church authorities. Bishop Butler called him in and reprimanded him for his actions, and said to Wesley, you are interfering in, the, in another, another priest's parish. You are interfering in someone else's work. This is not your parish. To which John Wesley replied, the world is my parish. Because of that reply, because of that statement, we are Methodists today. And we look to John Wesley as someone to guide and to lead and to encourage and strengthen and to help us to see what it means to be a vital Christian, to be someone who is making a difference. And so I simply remind all of us as United Methodists, the world is our parish, and it's going to call for our best efforts to make a difference not only in the life of our congregation, but in the life of our community and the life of our world. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.